Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Friday light informal research talk um, where we bring you uh, researchers from Grenfell and sometimes uh, farther abroad. Today, we are very fortunate to have a local researcher, um, Mark Lossier, who will be um, talking about uh, a project called This Must Be the Place. Just for a little background and context, he's a Canadian artist based in Cornerbrook, um, and he's a faculty member in our visual arts program. So he works in a wide range of media, including photography, film, installation, and sound. His practice is influenced by his background in both music and photojournalism. So we're very lucky to have him here today. Uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass things on to Mark. Thanks very much, Daniel. Uh, it's really nice to, to be here with, with everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, start by offering a land acknowledgement. And just to state that I understand a land acknowledgement as a transformative act meant to confront my place on Indigenous lands and to build mindfulness of our present participation in colonial leg legacies. I also acknowledge that the land on which I am presenting from is in traditional Mi'kmaq territory and acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Biathic, Mi'kmaq, Inu, and Inuit of this province. So once again, thank you for joining me. Um, Daniel and I have been trying to connect for this for uh, a couple of years now, so it's nice to finally be doing this. Um, today, I'm gonna be speaking about uh, a few different projects. Um, the title of my talk is called, This Must Be The Place. It doesn't refer specifically to any uh, certain top um, project of mine, but rather, um, a kind of a general approach uh, I've been thinking of in relationship to artworks I've been developing over the past several years and thinking about placemaking, communities, public spaces. So I'll just uh, open my screen here. So I'm a practicing artist. I teach in the visual arts program at Grenfell campus and have a background in photography, uh, photojournalism, uh, as well as a uh, background as a musician. I consider uh, my art practice as a kind of recording device. Um, and for many years have been interested in uh, ways that I can work with collections, archives, sometimes even creating new new archives in response to particular histories. Uh, the first project I wanted to share was a project called the Exchange Post, which was an ongoing project for several years between 2014 and 2017. It was a kind of traveling art market or art bazaar uh, in which uh, my position at the time as an artist uh, with connections to Toronto um, was building out uh, bodies of work in relationship to specific communities around Canada. I was invited to participate in Biennial in Sudbury, Ontario, which is a mining town. Well, uh, not so much a mining town anymore, but a uh, legacy of a mining town about five hours north of Toronto. I myself grew up in Toronto. At the time, I was living in California when I had gotten this invitation um, to participate in this Biennial, which was run by a local artist-run centre in uh in Sudbury and around the themes of uh, art marketplaces or marketplaces in general and economies i wanted to use this in some as an opportunity to think about visiting artists the role of visiting artists and also ways of learning um it was an opportunity to also shift my thinking around archival art practices um in, in ways that wouldn't necessarily position myself as an artist as the kind of um, bestower of knowledge, but rather someone who was rec trying to record and and learn throughout the process. So um, the 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 concept for the exchange post is this idea of creating an art marketplace in which the the currency rate for the exchange or acquisition of an artwork wasn't financial, but it was actually through um, uh, an, an ex expressed and kind of uh, written um, uh, uh, statement um, uh, from, uh, you know, members of the public. So I, what I was doing was um, working from the Toronto Picture Collection, uh, the Toronto Reference Library's Picture Collection, which is a kind of, kind of a, this 
kind of interesting like colloquial uh, archive um, at the Toronto Reference Library. And um, working specifically in the Sudbury files and working from documents and ephemera that I would find in there, clippings from magazines, calendars, postcards that were left there, and building uh, editions of artworks from these materials, and then bringing them with me to Sudbury and exchanging them with the public. So it was a bit of a meditation on the idea of collecting and what does it mean to collect artwork and what's the value of an artwork if you remove the financial component from it. It had a bit of a cheeky installation inside this older kind of community mall in Sudbury and we positioned it actually right next to a dollar store. So each artwork in the exchange post and the exchange post was carried out over several years. So I ended up, I did it in um, Sudbury. Um, I also made another iteration for North Bay. Um, I was in Dawson City where I, I set up one. I have done one in Halifax and lastly did one in Cornerbrook in 2017. And each artwork in the exchange post had a corresponding certificate or kind of acquisitions document. And so if individuals were interested in particular artworks, they had to fill out this exchange document. And then I would keep this document and the, uh, and, and the individual would, would keep the artwork. It was important that it, that a lot of the works had that well all the works actually had multiple editions and the point of that was and it was just, it was to in some ways collapse various perspectives on a particular history onto onto one another or and in some ways be able to juxtapose them as well um, because uh, you know history hi history is dynamic and memory is dynamic. And there isn't one single angle or perspective on a particular thing. And I was thinking about that in relationship to what was being depicted from the documents I was working from, but also um, in the artworks that I was making. And if you go to a museum or any sort of, you know, place that presents artwork, what moves one person in relationship to a particular work isn't necessarily what moves the next person. And I was just wondering about ways of gathering, collecting that uh, information and recording it. So it was kind of like one archive makes another archive here. You see an example of the exchange certificate. And so the, there are hundreds of artworks from the exchange posts and I've done hundreds of, sub subsequently did hundreds of exchanges. And whoever was um, conducting the exchange, whether it had been myself um, or uh, individuals um, that were helping me with it, they would be signing these documents so that they were part of the process as well. It was a really interesting way of, of learning and listening and um, yeah, meeting various members of, you know, of uh, these communities that I that I was um, installing in, and also um, meeting other other artists and getting to know other um, kind of institutions through the process as well. You can see here um, this particular reflection: a painting by my father in watercolor hangs on my wall. The three stacks, the slag, the sulfur burnt rocks, all represent Sudbury as it was before regreening raised its ugly head only because the super stack spreads its poison to further areas of the north. The photo shows Copper Cliff as it was when I went to high school there and how my father painted the black starkness of the nickel industry. I'm just really interested in the elements or memories of a particular place that mainstream media might not get, or might not, um, reflect on and, and this is an opportunity to do that um, through these exchanges. And it could be anything, it really was what up to you know what the individual was interested in. And if you know if if the works didn't stimulate any responses in some ways that was kind of a failure. And um, I like that element of chance in uh, in our practice and and so my the my approach when working from the materials that I found at the reference library library was, you know, really kind of using chance, using intuition, and just seeing kind of and it was a kind of freedom too to to work with it gave me a kind of freedom to work with these materials. Um, and the fact that I didn't have to kind of learn 
so much about them. I was just trying to use my intuition and then um, the learning would actually come through the installations, the exhibition of the work and the exchanges. An example of this installation at the Art Bar Projects at the, at the Annalee and Owens Gallery in uh, Halifax. And looking at the Halifax files at the Toronto Reference Library came across some uh, clippings from the Star Weekly in Toronto from 1966 of Africville. Um, and those are included in the Halifax uh, iteration of the exchange post. You can see here when I was talking about um, engagement with institutions, um, in, in this case, the Kyber Center for the Arts acquired this particular piece. And wherever I, wherever I could, I tried to include the, um, where it was available, include the provenance of the documents as well in the exchange. Um, so you can see, um, see that here at the top. And in uh, Cornerbrook, this is from 2017. I had the opportunity to uh, participate in the CB uh, or CB 150 uh, festival in um, 2017. Uh, and we installed at the Cornerbrook Archives and Museum, which is a great location. And um, uh, and that and that was that was really that that was slightly different for me in the sense that I I just moved to Cornerbrook. Me and my family moved here in 2016 um, when I took the position at Grenfell. And um, so it was the first uh, exchange post that I had done where um, I had spent some time like living in the community. Um, but I, I would say that at that time I was, you know, still kind of very, it was very fresh and, and um, I'm still, still familiarizing myself. Um, and, uh, but it was a little bit, a little bit different in that way and I knew more. More people around, and um, and that made it actually kind of uh, it made it kind of fun to be honest. I like this exchange here. Um, you can see it. So the like I was saying, so whoever's collecting the work, whatever they're leaving me, I I, I ask them to, um, you know, title it. And this is a seized opportunity, which is a little bit cheeky, which which I like. Um, I find this compositionally and aesthetically impressive. The texture and tone of the print is appealing. And it's the only opportunity I'll get to have an artwork of this quality without the exchange of money. Um, and this is uh, an image of Sir Richard Squire's um, building. Um, I wasn't able to determine from the picture collection in, in Toronto where um, the source was, but there was a, an image of it in, um, in their files there. The next project I wanted to show is a project called uh, Auto Text. Um, this is also a project that was has been exhibited multiple times, and and also plays ha has a kind of performative element to it as well, in the sense that you know its exhibition is kind of live and happening, and and there are things there are elements to it that are evolving throughout the course of its presentation to the public, and so much like the exchange post for things. Um, uh, it has that dynamic as well, and and that's and carried forward to with this project. Um, for I guess it was two thousand in two thousand fourteen, my wife and I we moved to uh, Berkeley, California, um, where she was and she was going to grad school. Um, while I was there, um, I was teaching uh, at the San Francisco Art Institute and also taking some um, uh, part time uh, freelance gigs just uh just photographing um for various companies and um i i went to um i i got a call from a friend of mine who uh said well we, we could kind of uh, partner up and uh photograph at the uh, headquarters of ebay and paypal and got to um go down to their campuses uh, and uh, spend a day there photographing and taking some video um, for some of the like projects that they were developing. And one of the things that just struck me that was was just how vast these spaces were, how many people were working there. Like, there were like 12,000 parking spaces and you needed a valet to actually get back to your, um, you know, get back to your car. Um, when you park there and you, and you need definitely need a, needed a car there it was just, it was just so big so the um 
and and so what I was sort of thinking of is just as the kind of physical, the infrastructure of the of of the internet of our virtual kind of existence and and how just kind of deceiving our our access to screens are, but that that you know in truth there are massive server farms, there are campuses that are um, that are there's the infrastructure of our digital lives. Um, and I started that that's just something that always stuck with me from my time on the West Coast. And in 2015, I was invited to uh, participate in Nuit Blanche in Toronto. And one of the things that was really kind of unusual about Nuit Blanche, and I think a lot of the kind of overnight, the one nighter overnight festivals, art festivals, is this kind of impossibility of seeing everything, particularly the ones in you know, large urban centers like, like Toronto. So you couldn't actually ever see everything. There were just so much programming. It was difficult to get across the city. You had like this crush of people kind of um, coming in. And I was just thinking about ways that you could kind of record an event or record an experience that was just so big and broad um, and kind of, call, you know, flatten the landscape in a way and um, and materialize aspects of the of our kind of lives on the inter of our lives on the internet, the idea of this printing press came came up and um, and and so uh, this this project uh, Autotext creates a live uh, Twitter stream of um, a live printing press using uh, printing um, basically tweets uh, on a scroll of paper and related to specific. Um, Mark, sorry, oh, I'm sorry, I was, I was going to say your screen was all black, but now it has text on it. <laughs> Yeah, no, thanks. So we're just kind of previewing the project. <laughs> so this, so it was installed first in Toronto, and then uh, subsequently was installed at the Art in the Open Festival in Charlottetown. This is some video from from there in 2018. And so the project uses um, basically use like a a, a receipt printer, um, and it prints a massive kind of scroll of paper that just prints continuously based upon specific hashtags or keywords. Um, and um, and it, creates, it creates an archive. I was really thinking about the materiality of the internet, just thinking about the archival. Um, it's very easy, I think, when people put like a tweet out into the world, it's it's funny how many times you hear how people are kind of like surprised that it catches up to them if they if they say something or misspoke or say something offensive. And in in short, this reminds people or concretizes the you know that that element of of um, of social media that that it is an archive that it's permanent that this infor this information is being you know stored somewhere. It is important for the project. I, I really enjoy projects that are have a performative element that can some comment on technology and also um, invite individuals to get a little bit closer to works than what you might usually be able to do I mean, kind of conventional museum spaces or gallery spaces. So this is one of those projects, you know, like the exchange post where you can, you know, individuals were invited to come up and they could handle this the scroll and 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 um, and get a closer look at it. The project was reinstalled as part of the future possible exhibition, uh, the second iteration in 2019 in St. John's at the Rooms. Um, the iteration, which was from um, artists in Newfoundland and Labrador from 1949 to the present. The difference being here is this is the first time the project was actually installed for several months. Um, and so rather being installed for, you know, just overnight, um, this is actually recording, um, you know, for the length of the exhibition for three months. You get a closer look at the um, the install here. And the idea with the installation was in some ways mimicking and playing playing with um, the formation of, um, we can just go back here actually, of uh, a, a movie projector um, with a feeding spool and kind of a take up real and that's because parts of my thinking uh, related to early constructivist films uh, like the Deza Virchov man the movie camera um, uh, this idea of like being able to record space record record a city record experiences and and that that um, 
the so the kind of construction and apparatus uh, um, and it kind of having a beginning and an end um, was kind of in thinking about um, actual analog film. Um, in 2017, actually, I should go back even a little bit further. Um, we moved, like I was saying, we moved here in, into to Cornerbrook in 2016. And at that time, I had heard about, um, I, I kind of learned, started to hear a little bit more about, you know, how the, the Royal Ontario Museum had been uh, in, um, uh, Western Newfoundland a couple of years earlier and acquired uh, a blue whale uh, or kind of process of blue whale or recovered blue whales for their collections. I didn't know very much about it at the time and, but it was, it, it just piqued my interest and I kept thinking about it. And it was, for, for me, I, I think the more I thought about it, um, the more I kept kind of thinking that like, it was just so, kind of in some ways uncanny for me as a kid who grew up um, just north of Toronto, had a lot of experience going to the Royal Ontario Museum on school field trips and um, and on, you know, summer vacations and things like that. And and um, it was now kind of bizarre to be living on the other side of this experience economy, to be living close to, so close to kind of to, to nature and landscape and into places where uh, institutions like the ROM would be uh, acquiring animals for, for their collections. And especially an animal as like a blue whale, the largest animal to ever be, you know, to ever live on this planet. And so I kept, you know, just thinking about that and it wasn't really a project at the time, but it was just more of my curiosity. Um, and uh, I, I just decided to contact uh, the ROM and, and contact uh, Mark Engstrom, who I, I kind of learned through some conversations, was kind of leading um, that process for the museum. And um, he invited me to to come and meet with him in uh, in Toronto uh, in, I think it was summer 2017. And that's actually when this exhibition opened. And this is the a photograph from the ROM's exhibition, Out of the Depths, um, which was in 2017. Um, and, um, yeah, we just had a really interesting conversation just about his experience in Western Newfoundland, um, in, in around like Rocky Harbor, mostly in around Grossmorn. Um, so like Rocky Harbor, Trout River, um, Woody Point. And then I went down to see the exhibition and I was completely just, just kind of blown away. I, uh, I had never seen. It, it, there was a couple of things I, I felt, I, if I can just think back to my emotions at the time, um, one was just how large this animal, uh, this animal was, um, to the point where I almost had a, 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 say a physiological reaction to it. It almost made me feel nauseous. Um, and the, the second, the second uh, emotion I think that I felt was just a tremendous sadness actually um, and just thinking about uh, the loss of this animal and um, what a what a tragedy it was um, to to learn that nine blue whales had actually died in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in 2014 and that it was the three that drifted into Grossmore and into in and around Bond Bay and Trout River um, that uh, you know that that and those are the ones that were recovered but it was just this, it, th those two things really really struck me and it kind of stuck with me and I, I started thinking more and more about the project and over the next year um i was able to gain access to the royal ontario museum's uh collections facility or one of their collections facility um which is run by a subcontractor called research uh, casting international that works for a number of uh, leading natural history museums around the world like the Field Museum in Chicago, the Smithsonian, um, and a number of other uh, institutions. Uh, it's located in Trenton, and it's kind of this nondescript commercial industrial site. And you wouldn't think much of it from afar, but as you begin to approach it, you notice there are some strange objects on the front lawn that, that seem in some ways kind of you know displaced. Um, 
out in front of this space, uh, you see these casts of um, Mayan sculptures and, and sculptures from from other places. They're hard to make up whether these casts and for various um, uh, projects that the museum is working on. This is a uh, research casting did um, a company actually worked on uh, Jurassic Park. So this is they they specialize in museological displays of dinosaurs, casts for movies. Um, so that's and they've been developing this area of work for probably you know, 30 or 40 years. So I was able to gain access into this space and 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 spend several days in there. I went for a site visit at first and the site visit was really what sparked things uh, for me. Uh, at this point, it was still curiosity. I had no idea really what, is, what I was thinking about doing. But once I got into the space, it started to come together. And it was this uh, this image that uh, that really uh, sparked things in me. Uh, I, I'd previously seen I'd, a year earlier had seen the exhibition at the ROM, and you know it's very kind of um, idealized in some ways depiction of this skeleton in the museological space. It was really different to see the the whale up and on display uh, inside a facility like this uh, inside a like, uh, an industrial facility with all of the equipment and armatures there and all of the artifice of the museum, which tucks everything away is kind of behind the curtain. Everything is brought kind of front and center and you have to, you know, confront the, you have to, you know, confront the violence of, of, of various kind of uh, economies that exist in relationship to oceans, the museological economies, um, ocean ocean economies in relationship to extractivism, you know the colonial legacies of uh, of of labor and the sea, um, and you know mercantilism. So it really kind of the oceans are in some ways like an entry point into kind of histories of capitalism and and this 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 perspective inside this particular space to see the annual here. It got I just really started to feel all these you know elements of um just start these emotions thing thinking of loss um thinking about economy thinking about tourism thinking about museums everything just seemed to kind of come together um but i didn't necessarily want to just capture the whale in this way and and in some ways reinscribe that violence i wanted to um i want i, I was really interested in taking a picture of a making images of whales that we hadn't seen before that would bring all of these elements together. So throughout the space, uh, you know, parts of various, you know, parts of the whales were being kind of uh, decreased, which is a process that takes several years. Um, so the, in order to display the, the skeletons for the whales, because there was so much oil, it takes many years to actually draw all that moisture and all that oil and grease out. And um, I should also say too, that one of the things that struck me was that just the display of the whale, it, it was uh, very much presented like a dinosaur, even though this is a, a although it's on the endangered species list, um, it's uh, an animal is very much still alive. So there's kind of like precursor kind of future in some ways, like this um, premonition element to it um, that that was on my mind as well. And, and if you look at the history of natural history museums and the ways that great whales have been exhibited um, traditionally, they're actually through life's kind of scale models so that, that try to present the whale as if it's alive. And so with its flesh and, and everything. And, and that's really shifted in the last several years to presenting um, whale bodies as skeletons that are very reminiscent of or that, that recalled dinosaurs uh, immediately. And, um, and many dinosaur exhibitions around the world have actually been supplanted by a uh, great whale uh, exhibition. So that gave me a lot to think about. One of the elements of the exhibition for me at the, at the ROM that was missing, and I think this is some, 
for more kind of like where something personal really come came in was um, my ex experience living here in Western Newfoundland and in Cornerbrook and um, they there it's there seemed to be in some ways like maybe like an imbalance and and I wanted to you know um, reflect on the economy between Western Newfoundland and the ROM that was established through this um, through this tragedy. In the back of the museum, the 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 ROM was actually helping to facilitate um, the processing of a whale that's going to be going to St. John's. Um, I think that's been delayed by the pandemic, but St. John's um, one of the, one of the blue whales that that died in 2014. The ROM facilitated that recovery um, for a memorial, and it's going to be going back. So there is this there is this kind of economy that's now established here between you know um, through this experience. Um, uh, in between the Rontar Museum and um, Newfoundland Memorial University. <clears throat> so, in thinking about the economy between places, thinking about the economy at the museum, uh, histories of uh, resource extraction, um, I was and, and how to depict um, uh, ask, you know, tourism um, in in that space as well, um, in terms of like our own engagement um, with with great whales and with blue whales. Um, I started thinking about um, projecting uh, images from tourism companies in Newfoundland, specifically Western Newfoundland and in the Bond Bay region, um, and and projecting them in that space at research casting. Um, I was the I'd been reading a text by Alan Sakula, Fish Story, um, in which he talks about um, still life painting and um, how a lot of still life canvases were illuminated by the by the oil from uh, the candles made from whales, and um, and that was something that I thought about just in terms of histories of photography um, as well with, with still life and. So there was a kind of magic magic lanterns project cinematic projections or you know uh, glass slide projections and um, as well as uh, you know thinking about you know these uh, Sikula's texts and, and still life painting and and that led to um, that that led to uh, bringing um, uh, these images from the tourist companies into into that space and using these digital projectors to to build images on with with the whale body. And so we got access to this to the space um, to ourselves for about an hour and a half. I had to work really quickly um, with all the lights because we had to turn all the lights off um, and then took several like hundreds of images and then eventually were able, over several months subsequently be able to put them together. And so, and so from this series of work, there's three of these larger uh, projected uh, like composite Composite images. Just this past uh, this past fall and winter, I was uh, I installed one of the one of the works in Trout River, uh, and this is this is one of the sites where the whale was recovered and was subsequently moved to Woody Point, where they could, um, like the museum was able to process it. Um, so the it's mounted along uh, the building of Allen's Fisheries Building, and it's actually just on the opposite side of this building, facing the waters, exactly where the whale was. So I was really just thinking, I was really thinking about place. 
in relationship to to that event i spent a lot of time talking to members of the community and actually i'm working on a project for building an oral history archive um, of those events um, and uh, i wanted to install a work you know in location that was directly connected to what had happened in 2014 and this particular piece it's it's quite large it's about seven feet high and 24 feet wide This is Bonnie and Bo Brake. Bonnie is the president of the Harbor Authority in Trout River and actually interviewed them both uh, recently for an exhibition uh, at, at the rooms called Hello Land, um, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. And so, uh, so this piece was, uh, uh, I guess when was it installed? November, end of November, uh, 2020. Uh, more recently, just the beginning of this year, um, as part of this a growing a project of mine, which is titled Narratives of Loss, uh, been developing another a, a sonic piece, a sound piece, um, which I'm calling How Deep Is the Ocean. I wanted to record the I wanted to record the sound of of the water um, from Vaughn Bay and from uh, so, so to to. Um, a kind of sonic and kind of ecological uh, representation of of the the shoreline and our connection to it, and what animals are hearing as they approach the shoreline in that area, and in thinking about it in some ways as a kind of um, yeah, as a memorial space. Um, <clears throat> it's a, a live audio feed from. So from Bond Bay, which is installed just out, just near the Bond Bay uh, Marine Station in Norris Point, and again, I was just thinking thinking about just listening and recording, and in some ways, you know, today, like maybe just listening and not kind of kind of intervening in something directly might is it has become in some ways like a radical act. And so what's presented at the rooms as part of uh, Hello Land Art, um, Art War and the Wireless Imagination, uh, just which looks at histories of wireless and broadcast technologies uh, in on the island here. And um, so this is uh, a live broadcast from a submerged hydrophone, which is an underwater microphone, um, which is broadcasting. So from the waters of Bond Bay near the shoreline um, and to it, to the galleries of the rooms and is really in some ways, like thinking about histories of museological exhibitions, particularly like panoramic paintings, and you know, which you know, kind of landscapes from from afar are brought to you in in the city. And this idea of again, kind of creating another, uh, trying to depict uh, a landscape, a distant landscape, in a new way um, through this through this project, and and, and trying to capture. Um, capture that space where the whales were. Just recently, uh, Trout River actually acquired the uh, uh, the piece, uh, which was installed uh, last fall. So very happy to say it's um, a permanent public artwork 
uh, in Trout River now. And um, so we'll be there for a long, for, for a while. And it was a really um, great experience to to work with the local community there and the municipality um, um, through the uh, their acquisition of the work. And really happy that, you know, an image of that reflects on that history, that rich history from 2014, that sensation of that whole experience, um, that there is um, some programming there related to it. And, and I think the, and the ROM is, all, is also working um, closely with the town um, uh, on uh, providing some assistance to some further uh, programming relating to that, uh, to those events. Uh, the last, uh, Project I want to mention is actually uh, more of a, a teaching initiative, but uh, but it's something that is uh, really kind of near and dear to me, and um, and it relates to uh, the exhibition of uh, student artwork and programming of student artwork at uh, from Grenfell campus and the visual arts program. It's called the Pulp uh, Grenfell Student Gallery Initiative, which was. Uh, Something that had started in uh, 2017 and then was able to work closely also with Grenfell students um, through some special uh, topics classes uh, to bring it to to life and then subsequently actually hire um, Grenfell students and alumni to work on it and 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 that's that um, kind of started in 2017 through some teaching and learning funding at Grenfell and um, been able to build on that over several years um, through a pilot space that we had at the Millbrook Mall. Uh, in uh, 2019, and this is a photograph uh, here of a, a student uh, student exhibition, which was curated by the talented Emily Critch, uh, which is a former uh, a Grenfell alumni, called uh, "Around the, the Throat of a Flower." And we're we got kind of delayed by COVID, um, but are relaunching some public programming um, in the near. Very near future this spring, um, again with teaching and learning, and also working closely uh, with um, some other uh, research grants that I've been a part of. Um, one of the partnerships we've developed is with Western Health uh, Long Term Care Home, Western Health Long Term Care Home, and um, exhibition of student uh, photographs of of their residents. And um, this is a photographic render, um, and we're looking for. Um, hope, hoping to find uh, a space to exhibit um, the, the portraits of, of these residents from Western Health, and um, uh, you know, sometime, sometime soon, hopefully in the next, uh, or possibly in the next month or so. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you, Mark, for sharing so many wonderful projects with us. Uh, so we do. We do have some time for questions, so um, I can relate questions that people have typed in. Um, if anybody who is in the WebEx chat directly wants to uh, raise their hand or, or jump in with a question, that's fantastic too. Should um, I close my share or should I just leave that open or I don't know? Pardon me? Should I close my screen or what's the what, best way to do it? Whatever you're, you prefer. So you're welcome to keep it open and I can relay stuff to you. Um, and that's uh, that's no problem that way. If you want to flip back to different images, you you could do that. But if you'd prefer to close it, that's okay too. Okay. Um, I, I was hoping to kick things off. So you shared um, a, a variety of different projects, um, and I, I found all of them really interesting. Uh, I was trying to think cool. about uh, how. So do you see connecting threads amongst all of them, or do you think of your work as uh, kind of modular where you have different phases or, or different projects that don't really feed into the next one. I, I can imagine either answer. I was trying to think about how the physicality of some of your work was was uh, seemed to be a, a focus, but then it, it shifted to soundscapes and uh, uh, less physical things. So I, I'm just curious about how you see um, the connecting thread or or disconnections amongst your work. Thanks. That's a really good question. Uh, I, I I do see. And I think it's funny. You only, I think, I think in hindsight, it takes a lot of time, like several years, before you look back on a project and what initially sparked it, and then throughout the course of the life of the project, you know, other things occur, you know, and it's in, you know, through through his presentation that give you like pause or things to think about. I do think for me, like the, a lot of my interests remain the same. I've, I've 
always been interested. I grew up in a family who was just kind of always really interested in media and um, watched a lot of movies. There was always a lot of kind of like magazines like around. And then subsequently I worked, I did, I worked as a, a freelance writer and photojournalist in Montreal for a couple of years before grad school. And I was also playing a lot of music uh, at the time too. I, I worked on friends films and scored you know scored their films and, and things like that and played in bands and that the kind of performativity element met like documentary <laughs> um and so i don't really get hung up too much on like materials i love i'm really interested in photography i, I teach it and i think i have I'm, i've always been interested in the kind of indexicality of a photo and so it's like a photo could be like a record it's like a, it's evidence in, in some ways i always to play with that um and but it but if we go like switch to sound and just recording sound well how is like sound different than an article or a picture you know um so just aspects of collections archives recording um are kind of key key threads uh i think through through my work and so i think i think that things tend to like jump around a little bit in the kind of material presentation but a lot of the interests kind of stay like kind of stay stay somewhat similar yeah great thank you I, I really appreciate that um we have a question from Jennifer so I'll pass it on to her um yeah I'm really interested in the microphone that you have at the Bombay Marine Station in the water and like getting that interest and getting though that feeling of what we you know what the sounds are have you ever thought of it doing it in like different locations because I just like Think like maybe if you did it like around St. Anthony with the icebergs or something and like those sounds and being able to experience that from afar would be really interesting. Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I so I actually have thought about doing it in a different location and um, the but to but I'm actually in more in thinking about the our experience of it. So at the at, at the rooms of I was in some ways like thinking I was thinking about. You know, um, like I was, I mentioned in the presentation, uh, you know, the hi histories of like, like panoramic paintings, like, for example, like panoramic paintings by like the Irish painter, like Robert Parker, or like ones that were exhibited in London in the 1800s of like, you know, uh, these massive paintings of Calcutta, you know, or like in bringing, bringing um, distant locations to you. Um, so that was the kind of idea at the, in St. In St. John's, this idea of kind of playing creating like a new image of a in some ways a different a different image or a new image of a landscape but the uh but this summer what i'm hoping to do actually is to broadcast um that sound from uh, on uh an fm channel in gross morn and to so that you'll be able to like be in the park and driving through it and you'll be able to actually like connect to the sound from underneath uh, from from the water in in Bond Bay, and what's happening actually on top of it too is which I didn't mention is that I'm broadcasting uh, conversations that I've been having with the local community and also scientists on the ROM about that um, experience. So I'm building an oral history archive. So I've been I've been meeting with people like Jenny Parsons who owns the Seaside Restaurant Trout River. Uh, Bonnie Brake and Mo, uh, Bonnie and and, and um, Bo Brake from Trout River, who are local fishers, and Mark Angstrom from the Rom, and I've, I have these conversations that I've uh, recorded, and those are actually being um, broadcast in the room space, like over top of the water, and and hopefully this summer in the park on the FM channel, um, we'll be able to do the same and be able to you know drive through with the park or connect to a signal in the airwaves and and um glean into like uh elements of that history i just said that's really awesome and i like i go to the park a lot especially mostly for lots of for work stuff and so i'll be listening to it instead of my regular podcasts <laughs> oh oh awesome well yeah it's it's amazing like in 20 i don't remember when it was my wife and i were driving um we we're driving up the coast to a friend's wedding. Was when we were living on the west coast, and we we're driving towards Vancouver. And I think it might have been in like Northern California or, or Oregon. And we were going through this like dense patch of like redwood trees, and there was this 
information radio signal, like a FM channel that you could connect to while you were driving through. And it was a history of the local elk. And we tuned into it and you get this like scratchy signal and here's someone like talking about this history and there were, of course we didn't see any elk but it was just created this really unbelievable in its absence and just through the sound and this voice it created this incredible visual in my mind of of that of of that landscape of the the animals over there and um so it's it always stuck with me and that was like seven years ago and so this project is like kind of it's it's taken i was always thinking about like is there like a, a subject or a place that i could do something like that and this is um so, so that's what that's where that comes from yeah i know i think that's really interesting i think like the visitor experience of those who visit the park to to hear that will be really like that'll enhance it all so i think it's awesome Great. All right. Uh, I have an, another question that I was hoping to ask. So I, I found the idea of the exchange posts really, uh, really cool. And I, I think part of what you mentioned you were exploring there was um, the idea of of removing um, kind of dollars from from uh, exchanging art or or getting art. Uh, I'm wondering how, if you have continued to think about that kind of aspect uh, too. So uh, congratulations. You mentioned that. Um, I think Trout River acquired the art piece, and I'm not sure, like so. Yeah, I'm just just curious about your thoughts on um, the value of art and removing um, these. Uh, the, I guess the way that we typically value things um, with dollars. I, that probably uh, wasn't okay. Hearing a question. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, let me know if that wasn't very clear uh, or coherent. Uh, well, I mean. I, it's, I, I guess like what you're asking is like, am I continuing to think about like the value of, of works? Like when, like outside of monetary value? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that project really, it, it, it was, it was amazing as a kind of like a testing ground. So I do, yeah, I do continue to, it, it gave me a lot of um, things to, to think about uh when like doing the exchanges with individuals one of the things that, that came up that was kind of it's like i didn't mention it in the presentation but sometimes people would fill out like would fill out one of the exchange certificates and they would come back the next day and it would be like oh i don't like what i left i didn't leave you enough for this work um i i, I need to give you more actually for this it's not like so and that would happen. That happened happened a number of times uh, where people would kind of want to. It were not really cor corrections. It was like they felt like they hadn't done enough or like given me enough to like earn it in a way. Um, and uh, and I always I thought that was really really interesting that people would spend like more time and wanted to. That kind of it created like this kind of there was a reciprocity there. And then sometimes people just like, you know, like they they. They didn't leave very much at all. So I like that element of chance. But I do continue to think about it. The um, the like the act the work um in Trout River that's there, um, which was uh which was a really lovely like um conversation with the town. They've been wanting to have um I think in in some ways they Trout River is a real like working working town and has less of a kind of presence in terms of tourism and um and but they're also a central like a central location in relation to what happened in like 2014 how and and the whale that the that's in the roms collections now and so um so we, we um they instigated a conversation um just around the like acquiring acquiring the work and um and like I won't go into like into details about it, but you know, it was it was a really like lovely exchange, and it wasn't. Um, it felt like it was something. One of the things that was really important to me, I'll just say, is that like that they wanted to have it there, as opposed to you know, it wasn't like a piece of public artwork that was just kind of like put on them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Where a lot of like public artwork, like maybe the community doesn't really want it or respond you know, um, and they weren't necessarily a part of the conversations. Um, and, um, and so, uh, in, in this case, um, what was nice about it is that they led the conversation and, uh, and, and, and wanted to, 
want, wanted it to be there. Yeah, that, that sounds like a, a very positive experience for everyone. And I, I think it's really interesting how you bumped up against the, this kind of reciprocity norm where if there was no exchange of money, people really, uh, if, if you had put in a dollar value or something, people might not have felt the same, uh, same need to make sure they're not taking advantage and getting more than, uh, the, than they had. That, that's really cool. Uh, we do have another question um, from Facebook from uh, Melissa. You referred to confronting violence when talking about the whale skeleton when it was outside of the museum space. When you introduced your sonic piece, you talked about how just listening has become almost radical. I was really drawn to those descriptions, and I'm wondering if you could talk about how those perspectives inform your work. Yeah, well, I just think you know we live in the and thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Melissa, for the question. It's a really great question. Um, we live in the information age where everything is just so incredibly saturated. We, I think we all know at this point that the ocean is saturated with noise and that it is, um, that, that noise is making it difficult for animals to communicate. It's, it's, uh, jeopardizing their uh well it's jeopardizing their well-being um and i didn't want to put anything in the water that would add to that i had thought about i'd been thinking about this project for a long time uh, and thinking about you know what we would be what we would hear if it should be broadcasting into the water but rather i actually thought that the, 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 I guess, like the most sensitive and generous thing to do would be to just listen. And, you know, we would hear, we would hear the, the ecology of that space. And if uh, there are boats and other things that go by, and there are things that do, it's incredible. Um, we've heard boats like going by with the, with the hydrophone on and it's incredibly loud. Um, and so I wanted to just give individuals a chance to, to just, just, just listen and just kind of contemplate those elements. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I think we are bumping up against the end of the time that we have, but uh, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day uh, to be able to share your work with us and uh, and answer questions. So we really, really appreciate that. Uh, also, a special thanks to Steve for helping us get set up today. Of course, uh, Jennifer and Garrett for helping organize the Flirt series and uh, for Marcom staff for helping with all the poster design and, uh, and getting word out. So we will have another flirt talk coming up uh, next Friday. No, uh, Thursday. Sorry, Thursday, yes, because Friday, right, yes. So next Thursday, stay tuned. Um, anything else that I need to say, Jennifer? Did I forget? No, that's, that's, no, that's no. Good. I was just gonna say next week's is on Thursday because <laughs> Friday's on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you again. So yes. any closing closing thoughts or closing words? Uh, just thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone who's in the internet world uh, for, for tuning in and uh, yeah, I really appreciate um, uh, the opportunity to to share my work with you. All right. Fantastic. Awesome. Take care.